Magnum TA featured this past week on Dark Side of the Ring, Jim. And of course, you were the star of the episode. Great job oh, on it. Oh, come on now. I was not. Uh, Magnum was the star of the episode. Um, I was merely spitting facts, as the kids say. Um, no, I, again, this one we talked about was more, it has a more uplifting tone by the end of it because Magnum did go on to have a successful career, even if it wasn't in wrestling and and do well and have, you know, family and et cetera. And he was there to give his, his insight, which a lot of the people that are the subjects of the dark side episodes are not able to is be there to give their, their story personally. So, but I think it, it, it I know you don't like some of the, historical inaccuracies that come from trying to do, you know, a guy's 30 year story in 45 minutes or whatever. But in this case, there wasn't really any problem with that because Magnum's window into business was so short and that the, the, he made such an impact so quickly. And then the tragedy was so high profile and, you know, and then soon after, you know, he was, in, in, not involved in the business anymore on an ongoing regular basis, but those that was the hottest period of NWA business. So the matches still exist to this day everywhere, not just the network, but in on everything. So it, it's like they just really had to tell the the brief story of how he got in the business, his meteoric rise, and the crash. And that was a more linear story, easier for people to understand. But tell me what you thought of it, besides blowing me. Come on, we're not Uncle Dave and fucking Alvarez. You're not a train hey. ship. You don't, you don't have to tell me I was the star. I could, I can be the best friend. No, you're the best one in all these things. I mean, being very honest with you, I don't know why Jake was in this. Jake really didn't add too much. And when you think of Magnum TA's career, Jake wasn't around too much. <laughs> Maybe a, think a minute in Florida, but no. I think they had done the sit down with him and they just asked him, what do you think of Magnum? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was all right. I'm not a, I don't want to say too much bad stuff because you like these guys. I'm not a fan of their oh, style. Oh, come on. I'm not a fan of their style and I'm not a fan of, uh, you mentioned I'm not a fan of the inaccuracies. The script has always been a problem, but maybe the worst thing about this show is Jericho as the narrator. And I understand the benefits of having a dual citizen or more specifically a Canadian citizen as I the mean, narrator he's, for he's, a Canadian he's, production. He's a, a bi-coastal person or bi-country person. But when you have him just reading the script as slow as he can, and he sounds bombed, I don't know if he is or isn't, but it didn't sound natural. Not the way a narrator should sound. It sounded like, all right, we'll use this guy for the tax credit. And then I don't even build up the fact that it's Jericho. Just use any random Canadian if that's what you're going to do. You're saying he's not Liv Schreiber. No, he's the best. He's the very best of all time. When you see him in a movie, it's like, I can't even believe it's the same voice. Like, doesn't even seem like the same guy. Mel Blanc is a guy I would have picked if he was still around to do this. I don't know if he would have picked you, but I think the narration and the, and the, I think the narration is pretty spectacularly bad. Well, but on a more positive Nothing note. about Tully. Not, that was the other thing I was surprised <laughs> with. Nothing. I mean, he ends up married to Tully's wife, well, the wife of... Next to Nikita, his most famous opponent, not a word about any of that. Well, that, that was one thing that was kind of glossed over. When she got the lower third, Courtney Blanchard Allen, and that was a whole situation that went on in Charlotte at the time in the late 80s. I, and I did notice his first wife, Magnum's first wife, Tamara, it was nice of her to get up from the programming center where she had just had shock therapy and, and was oh, hypnotized. Stop it. Will you stop it? It sounded like she had been a combination of hypnotized and on sodium pentothal, truth serum. She seemed like a very, very nice woman. If I could ask you a question, because you referenced something, and it was kind of referenced in the documentary, but never overtly said. I, I actually don't know the answer. You said Magnum TA has been successful after wrestling. What does he do? What has he done with his life? I have, am not going to pretend to give you all of the details because I've seen and talked to Magnum at various points at FanFest and et cetera. But um, among the th a couple of things I know he was, he was doing, he was, um, oh, God damn it. You know how I am with technology. 
Cell phones, cell phone towers, cell phone technology. He started some kind of company or was involved with some kind of company at a high level that did those things for a while and then branched out into, God damn, I think I've actually got an email from him at one point where it had his job title, but he's been successful in actual business, not, you know, show business. Good. That's very good. <laughs> anyway, what I was going to say, did you love the old footage, though, again? Again, all those people, whether you see them in the arenas, whether it was the wrestling footage, there's all those girls jumping up and down, and it's not like here and there. You, that was the Crockett crowd in the 80s, was entire ringside sections with maybe 10% of them were men. And I mean, you can see the pants and they're jumping up and down and they're wearing the T-shirts and they're frothing at the mouth like it's the Beatles. And that was for the rock and roll, for Magnum, for Dusty, et cetera, et cetera. But then, as we, I think, mentioned, for whatever reason, we were talking about it a while back, what a major American city now would be not paralyzed, but in a state of perplexion and grief and upset over any professional wrestler having any kind of accident or issue. The internet would blow up worldwide. Everybody that's into wrestling would obviously be upset, whether it be the Iron Sheik passed away or superstar Billy Graham, or there'd be tributes or whatever. But this was Charlotte, North Carolina, front page news of the Charlotte Observer, on every Six o'clock and eleven o'clock news, people candlelight vigils outside the hospital. The fucking mood at the arenas after the news got out the over the following week, you could tell a the, still thousands of people are showing up, but there was a different feeling. What wrestler today in any particular city or state, but maybe Lawler in Memphis, he always gets headlines with health issues. But that's not even fair because that's from 50 years ago. What wrestler today could make that kind of impact as Magnum's accident did on a, a Charlotte at that point was the second biggest city in the Southeast behind Atlanta? There's nobody of, of that level that's over to a mainstream audience. Of that era, the only other wrestler tragedy of any sort that got anywhere near that attention, I would assume, would be David Von Erich's death. Yeah. And well, and and again, that's I'm talking about what wrestler today could even. No, I don't think I don't think you can nobody. do that today because even yeah. like an MJF, for instance, when he goes to Long Island, he's a baby face. They know he's from Long Island, but that's once every six months or whatever. As opposed to Magnum TA was local; he was theirs. David Von Erich, those girls in Texas loved him. They had watched him for years. It's a different relationship that. Yeah the fans locally have with wrestlers nowadays. Well, and now in uh, punk in Chicago, I mean, and I'm not wishing any ill on him. And I'm not trying to say that he's not a wrestling draw in Chicago, but if punk was in a car wreck, would it be, would there be candlelight vigils at a hospital in Chicago? Would it be on the six o'clock television news on every channel? You know, maybe for a minute, but it wouldn't be the, yeah. And there's just there's if the young no, bucks super kick themselves to death would Cucamonga <laughs> shut down if if the if the exploding sneaker backfired <laughs> and lodged in his brain would yeah would Cucamonga be flooded with grief and have a state funeral procession down the main street no because these that's why the, anyway back to the Magnum special that's what I'm the footage that they had of the of the people answering the phones at the hospital and of the news footage and of the, you know, comments from the fans at the arenas, a lot of which, you know, Crockett had shot at the time and, and, uh, you know, it was on their television as well. You know, that just showed you it was a bond that that's why wrestling was so hot because those guys, those personalities had gotten over and the people were into them and they lived and died with them. It wasn't about, oh, I hope Magnum can do a belly-to-belly -belly suplex again. It was, no, they wanted to fucking, wanted Magnum to be the world champion and, and all the women wanted to marry him. <sighs> what would you think of, and again, without 
making any comments about her appearance. What did you think about the wife saying how she found the Polaroids, or I assume Polaroids, photos in the luggage of other women? How many wrestlers, specifically in Mid-Atlantic, did that happen to? Well, there was... <laughs> at, at some points, there was the occasional picture or pair of panties or whatever that mistakenly ended up somewhere. But, but no, that was, you know, it was kind of shit that took place, which is why they among the reasons that, uh, you know, they split up at that point. And, you know, similar things were going on with uh, the Blanchard family, which is why that I don't want to talk about everybody's goddamn it, it, days of our lives. Um, but uh, but those things happened. And, you know, sometimes if you wanted to fucking fuck with somebody, somebody would fuck it. And of course, you'd, you'd, you'd make sure that they found out the real story later on. But I've known a couple of guys that actually fucking put as a rib, put a pair of panties in another guy's fucking bags and carry them home and see what would happen. Oh, no. But, they, but they, then they would cover their tracks because they would fucking let the fucking wife in on it and then just fuck with the guy. But nevertheless, back to uh, the... But Dark Side of the Ring, Magnum TA, just... It was a it was a nice, I thought, encapsulation of the story, the basic story that Magnum got screwed around by Buzz Sawyer when he wanted to break into business. He was a fan when he was a kid. His father, Dan, what a personality he had. He'd have made a good wrestler fucking 20 years before that. And he said, fuck it, I'm not going to take that line down and got in a bit, Chase Sawyer got into business anyway and in the space of five years became the hottest baby face in the NWA under Dusty and the next world heavyweight champion before the accident. And that, you know, that was, and, and also, you know, in mid South, I've talked about when we worked with him in 84, when they had teamed him up with wrestling Two. that was the first program we had in mid South wrestling, even though he was green and, you know, he would manhandle you because he was so stout and Bobby would come back to the corner like, Oh, Jesus Christ. You could tell the people liked him and he had fire. He had that intensity overall that people got with, and and whether he was selling, even though he was green, it looked legitimate. It looked like he was in a fight. Everything he was doing, or when he made a comeback, the, then the when he was green, the heels felt like they were in a fight. Uh, but you could tell he had something in, and he was like twenty four months in. What did you think, because there's always been that debate about whether or not he was going to win the NWA title and whether or not it would have happened at Starcade 86. What did you think of him actually telling the story of going out to eat and being told that we got the blessing from Bob Geigel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, this is also the same thing. David Crockett earlier in this thing goes, I'm David Crockett, I'm Jim Crockett's son. And then they showed Jim Crockett Jr. So yeah, it's well, it's Jim Crockett Jr.'s son. Actually, they showed both of the Jim Crockett's. They just showed Jim Crockett Jr. next to David wishes he was Jim Crockett Jr.'s son. They be never, much younger. They never referenced Jim Crockett Jr. He just says, I'm Jim Crockett's son, and they put up the image of Jim Crockett Jr. <laughs> but what do you think about the idea that, according to Magnum here, the title switch was agreed to? It was going to happen. Well, no, but, but they, they, it, you may have gotten that impression in the editing, it they they said it was agreed to. He he was going to be the champion, but it wasn't going to be at Starcade '86, as we've talked about. That was such a quick turnaround. I think they were going to hold it off. And another thing they said in this program was that because Jimmy Garvin was on it, they just started an angle between Magnum and Garvin because Magnum had finished the best of seven series with Nikita, and. While Jimmy says, oh, we were going to blow the territory wide open. It was already blown wide open, Jimmy. If we couldn't, the, we'd need to build bigger buildings at that point to get any more people in. But Magnum was going to have more triumphs in shorter term things than the thing with Nikita over more of the heels in the company. I think before I would look at that point more like a Great American Bash the following summer type of thing, where you can see Dusty wanting to replicate 
something maybe in Charlotte at the stadium where instead of Flair coming in in a helicopter, it's Magnum coming in with a fucking band of Hell's Angels. I don't fucking know. But it, this was the middle of October. Starcade was Thanksgiving into November. That's still quick. I think it was going to happen. Uh, it just, I don't think it was going to be that quick. Crockett Cup? Um, it, I don't, I don't know. Baltimore. What was that, April great, 87? Yes. Baltimore would have been a great location and it would have brought the house down. But I think to put the belt on Magnum, Dusty would have wanted it to not be in the middle of a two night tag team tournament that's labeled as such. It would be, remember, he always labeled Great American Bash the price of freedom or whatever. It would have been something on a big show, whether it be Starcade or Great American Bash or something, where he could label it after Magnum's Quest. You know, it, it, Dusty always named shit. Remember? And when he had a loser leave town match in Florida with him and whoever, it was the last tangle in Tampa. And so whatever, Dusty loved Magnum, and he would have wanted to make that. Remember Starcade 86, Night of the Skywalkers? That was the subtitle because, you know, the, the scaffold match was the draw. The, night, the year before, Starcade, the gathering, because they'd come on the idea of the double location. We're going to sell out Atlanta and Greensboro. And the gathering of the fans. Dusty loved themes. If And if it was a, if it was a show he'd done before, he wanted like, you know, the, the sequel title. You know, Star Trek IV, The Wrath of Khan, whatever the fuck it may be. So I think it would have been a show built somewhat around the theme of Magnum finally climbing the mountain. And you think it probably would have been at the earliest around the time of the Great American Bash. Well, because think about this. After Starcade, I mean, again, the Bunkhouse Stampede was a Battle royal theme thing that went through Christmas. And then the Crockett Cup, just three months later, was the next big major show that they, that they did at that point. And again, Crockett Cup, two nights in the same location, massive house, great, but... It's themed after tag teams. And then the bash would have been the next thing, the next big series. It was presented in this documentary, I want to say by David Crockett, although I'd have to go back and double check, by Magnum getting injured, Magnum having this wreck, was one of the contributing factors towards the NWA not being able to succeed against Vince McMahon and having to sell the Ted Turner. Well, do you think that's the case? And... Whenever anyone looks at the problems that came into the booking in 87 into 88, do you think Magnum not being there was part of the problem? Because Dusty, although he did well with turning the key to babyface, do you think it messed Dusty's plans up not having Magnum there? Um, well, yes. Yes, it did mess his plans up. And no, it didn't contribute to the sale to Turner Broadcasting two years later. And I'm not saying anything bad about David. David would like to romantically think, well, you know, if that hadn't happened, but even though Magnum was a draw and an attraction, it he wasn't, even if Vince would have gone on even without Hulk Hogan. He just wouldn't have gone on as far as fast or as profitably. Crockett Promotions, the problems they had two years later had, were more, and even if it was, it was more than Dusty's booking. It was more than having lost a couple of stars. It was more than, to be honest, because of the timing and the crucial nature of what was going on and the facts that we can look at the gates before and afterwards, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson leaving and going to New York hurt Crockett's business multiple times more than Magnum's wreck. In actuality, not in theory. In theory, we're saying if Magnum hadn't had his wreck, then business would have been better over the next two years. That's theoretical, but it's empirical evidence that when Tully and Arn left, the bottom fell out of the fucking house shows and never came back. We, we had done two or three 
hundred thousand dollar plus gates in the few weeks before Tully and Arn left and only did one afterwards for the next six months. So uh, with when Magnum had his wreck, everything that was so hot at that point that it not only didn't affect business, it may have helped business because it drew more people's attention into what was actually going on right then and or Nikita suddenly doing the baby face turn, I cry for Magnum TA. That was even hotter than what, you know, Magnum's current program with gorgeous Jimmy Garvin would have been. This was a big fucking deal. Dusty and Nikita together, the superpowers. So it screwed up the plans and a lot of the long term but it actually goosed business at the time. Whereas two years later, I mean, they still had Dusty, they still had Flair, they still had a lot of people, but the problems that Crockett ran into, as we've documented on this program umpteen times, were more business infrastructure oriented and interference from Vince sabotaging the pay-per-view clearances and locking them out of a lot of the buildings. And they're, you know, just trying to get too big too fast rather than any talent that they had or didn't have on the roster. How different do you think Magnum TA's career would be if Barry Windham hadn't jumped to the WWF in 84 and aligned with that question? Was Magnum TA the kind of guy, from your estimation as someone who was there, that could have had a run that would have lasted a couple more years in Mid-South, the way a Duggan or... Well, really, Duggan's the best example because he was a babyface at that time. The way that a Duggan or a Steve Williams or other guys did, would Magnum have had that kind of run there if he hadn't gone to work for Mid-Atlantic or Crockett? Yes. And he probably would have wanted it and stayed there for it. Because if Dusty hadn't called and said, hey, I got this opportunity, Magnum had been figured in in Mid-South since he got there and had evolved and learned and it was the perfect for a guy like magnum that was athletic and good looking and serious and coachable and a grown-up adult even you know even with his age sometimes they were and sometimes they weren't watts loved that kind of guy and he saw money in him because he featured him the whole year from the, the year we got there he was the tag team champion when we got there and by the time we left, he was the North American heavyweight champion, right? So Watts would have done with like he did with a DiBiase or with a Duggan or with a dog to a dog to a lesser extent picked up on a lot of it, but he got by on charisma and star power. But he would have taught them the intricacies of the psychology of the business and et cetera, and the, he'd have been... Magnum would have been in Watts's military school for wrestling and probably been a more experienced worker and more well-rounded than if, than if he'd have than what he did, which was take Dusty's offer and jump in. And remember the belly-to-belly 60-second -belly win streak was not just because he wanted to get Magnum over dominantly. It's because still... As a single in that roster pool with the Flares and the Blanchards and all those guys, he was still a little rough when he first got to Crockett, still a little green. So the idea was smash him over on television, and people will think he's so good he beats people instantly, and then have him put his time in in the house shows where the more experienced guys can work with him there. And and it, that worked too. but. Um, and that's the thing. If Barry Windham had left and Dusty hadn't had a spot open and called Magnum, Magnum could have stayed easily in Mid-South for as long as he wanted to, as long as he could take the travel and the schedule. And he would have been a perfect guy that Watts would have been teaching. And then it would have been opened up for him to go to Florida or to the Carolinas or to anywhere else in the business. He would have been in demand. Or Watts would say, sorry, we booked you into Dallas. Cancel your plans. <laughs> well, it could have been Dallas, too. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he could have gone anywhere. And, 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 and I'll say one thing. 
he could have gone anywhere. I don't think Vince would have been after him. And the reason why, maybe, maybe he would have to some extent, but he would have changed him and ruined it if he had him. Because Magnum, didn't, he didn't smile. That's one thing. He had a smile. He's a smiling person, but he was a serious straight ahead. He wasn't, he was the best friend. Uh, the, in, the, in an action movie, Vince would have wanted him to be smiling and happy, like the kind of best friend in the buddy cop movie. Whereas he's more like the fucking Schwarzenegger. And he was just serious about everything and fucking bore straight ahead and the people got behind him. I don't think he would have been good doing any type of levity or, you know, or having a food fight on the set of Tuesday Night Titans. I think that would have been the antithesis of what got Magnum over. The leather jacket and the fucking biker look and the mustache and the fucking... I'm going to kick your ass. And he looked like he was really trying to do it. I guess one of the good things about watching this is the fact that it's a dark story. I mean, it's dark side of the ring, but Magnum, like you said, he seems good. He's telling this story about this horrible incident that changed his life and cost him millions of dollars, likely. He's got a smile on his face. Well, not a smile, <laughs> but he seems pleasant. He seems, he lives with it. You know, it's not yeah. something that eats him up. And it, you know, it, I've seen him at various points um, where he does have the the scooter and or some things that, you know, that help him get around long distances or across a building or whatever. But he's, and he still has limited, you know, if any use in his right arm, but he's, he signs with his left, he's adapted and adjusted and, you know, he can get around and do a lot of the things that. You know, they said he was never going to fucking do, and he's still doing them 35 years later. Well, that's the Magnum TA story from Dark... Is that what it's called? Is it, or is it just Magnum TA? Mag well, it was Shattered. Shattered. Magnum TA story. That's right. Or the 80s Rolling Stones single, whichever one you want to refer to. Uh, Shattered was uh, not from the 80s. That was from... That was what? from... That was from... Um, some Girls, I lost the name of the album for a second, that came out in... 78? 78. All right. Sorry about that, Chief. That was their attempt to be a punk band in that song, but anyway, 